issues and coming back for the second session, but we have such a packed slate for today that uh, our staff has really sort of timed this down to the last 30 seconds. Um, and, uh, and so thank you all. Our second uh, panel is about, uh, continues to be on the economics of Korean unification. And here we're looking at the opening for business, foreign investment after unification. Um, um, let me introduce our, uh, our panelists very briefly. Again, their, their very distinguished bios are in your program, so I won't give a full introduction. Um, <clears throat> uh, our first presenter is uh, Tom Byrne, who is a uh, senior vice president, manager, and Moody's spokesperson uh, for the Sovereign Risk Group in the Asia Pacific and Middle East regions for Moody's in Investor Service. Uh, he's the lead sovereign analyst for China, Japan, and Korea, uh, and has come a long way right, from Singapore via Boston. Right? <laughs> um, our second presenter is uh, uh, Bill Brown, who is a senior advisor to the National Intelligence Man Manager for East Asia, and the Korea's in the office of the Director of National Intelligence. And our dis two discussants, our first discussant is Dr. Sumi Terry, who is a senior research scholar at Columbia University's uh, Weatherhead East Asian Institute. Uh, as many of you know, she served as Deputy National Intelligence Officer for East Asia at the National Intelligence Council, and then served as Director for Asian Affairs on the National Security Council for the Obama and Bush administrations. Uh, and then our uh, last but not least, our, dis our uh, second discussant is Dr. Uh, Dr. Park, Park Hyun Jung, who is a senior research fellow at the Korea Institute for National Unification, or KINU, and really has written some of the most insightful pieces about what is going on inside uh, North Korea and the North Korean leadership. So, We'll begin with uh, Tom. Okay, Thanks good. again for joining us. Please. I think I'll follow up. Okay, very good. Mark's example, I knew it was the podium. Well, I have to thank uh, Victor for uh, inviting me. It's always good to be back in the U.S. And um, I've had, had a to continue with the sports uh, metaphors, I've had a good week. I went to an <laughs> Orioles game with uh, my son on Sunday, and now I'm watching the Dream Team perform. <laughs> I don't know if you should include me in that team. Um, but Victor also let me off a bit easy, uh, because he, uh, when I was invited two or three weeks ago, he uh, said, don't worry about writing a paper, which is good. <laughs> no time to do it anyway. Uh, but just give some quote unquote random comments. I'll try to put a little more structure and just some random uh, uh, comments. Um, uh, first of all, and in, in, I think my comments are not prescriptive, so I'll keep my um, credit rating analyst uh, hat on. Uh, we actually never have been prescriptive in our work, uh, and now we cannot be because we are a regulated uh, industry. Uh, so um, the I think the overall framework that I'm looking at is uh, not the collapse, uh, but really an opening of North Korea as a bridge uh, towards unification. Um, and I'm looking at the, the speaking notes that Michael Green has. Uh, I think the scenario that I see is the most easy to grasp uh, you know, mentally or analytically is the, is the delayed unification um, uh, concept. Um, and in that, I think, Unification can be done perhaps on, on Seoul's terms. I don't think unification can be done unless Beijing's terms are met as well, and perhaps this afternoon we'll get more, more into that, um, looking at the history of, uh, of, of uh, the PRC on the Korean, Korean Peninsula and also how China's behaving recently in the region. Um, uh, that being said, um, of course, uh, the way I look at it is that uh, unification would have considerable near-term costs for the South Korean government under the delayed unification scenario, um, uh, but also bring uh, longer-term economic benefits. Um, I think the, the degree of the costs and benefits will be influenced by the time frame of a successful political and economic transformation of North Korea. Uh, nonetheless, the elimination of the existential threat to South Korea removes a low probability but high severity event risk to its economy, which is actually um, a rating uh, 
constraint for us, uh, not so much on the sovereign rating, but when we look at structured finance uh, deals in, in Korea. And I think it would have psychological effects, which positive psychological effects, of course, which are probably unquantifiable. Um, so uh, basically, uh, I'm looking at uh, a, a unification that is uh, externally supported, uh, but also internally driven, and I'll get to that. Um, I'll get to that later. Uh, for, so Seoul has considerable amount of fiscal headroom to absorb uh, over time, I think, the cost of an opening um, of North Korea or unification. And this would involve direct uh, fiscal transfers and infrastructure investment, of course. Um, South Korea has uh, its debt levels on the government's balance sheet, directly on the government balance sheets, are rather moderate, uh, something like 32% of GDP. Most advanced industrial countries, particularly those who went through the uh, severe crisis in 2008 and the recession in 2009, the debt levels are about 80 to 100 percent of GDP, including the U.S. on a general government basis, including the, uh, the states. Uh, and uh, uh, so the debt burden is not much, at least on the government's balance sheet. Um, however, a greater fiscal space can be generated if, uh, if Korea's public sector uh, companies uh, the non-financial uh, public corporations who actually act as arms of South Korean economic policy, if their debt uh, uh, can be reduced, because uh, these are contingent liabilities on the, on the balance sheet and also on the, on the, for the taxpayers in Korea. Now, the reason I think this is important, because I, th I think, at least in the initial phases of an opening, um, if South Korea is involved in the economic investment in, in North Korea, that it's the public sector companies that will be involved, something like Korea Housing and Land, I believe they're involved in Kaesung. Um, maybe Korea Rail National Railway Corporation as the rail links are, are established uh, from Russia through the peninsula. Um, uh, KEPCO as well, um, probably not building nuclear power plants in North Korea as they do elsewhere, but, but developing a, a grid in North Korea which I don't think exists. Well, according to satellite photos, it doesn't exist really. At least at night it doesn't exist. So I think these will be in the vanguard. Later on, I think the JBL will follow, but there's preconditions to that, and I'll get to that. Um, so also some other comments. Uh, South Korea's national savings are ample, I think, for a delayed unification process. It wouldn't completely derail um, uh, uh, South Korea's um, uh, economic or fiscal fundamentals. Um, or probably its growth trajectory uh, during this delayed unification period. And um, South Korea has a, a, a fairly strong external payments position. Uh, reserves, uh, net international investment position is okay. I mean, not, not, not uh, terribly strong. But still, I think, strong enough to, to avoid uh, being buffeted by turbulent conditions in the global financial markets in the future. As it, as it undergoes a process of investment and in, in aiding, externally supporting North Korean uh, unification. Uh, now, as others uh, today have said, I think the benefits of an opening and eventual unification of North Korea would be most fully realized by a robust role of the private sector. Now, this is just not the South Korean private sector, but a North Korean private sector. Um, South Korea's firm's participation in, um, in the opening and also the development of a North Korean private sector, uh, I think really hinges on the establishment of a stable and predictable investment regime in North Korea. However, uh, experience so far in North Korea and elsewhere suggests that the transition from a capitalist, uh, transition from a communist or a socialist system uh, to a socialist market economy is neither smooth nor rapid. Uh, in many frontier markets, uh, protectionism and resource nationalism have prevented foreign investment from playing a strong, consistent, um, catalytic role. If we look at the case of Mongolia, um, which has uh, actually got off to a real fast start after uh, leaving the, the, when the Comic-Con broke up and uh, when it uh, uh, went through the economic transformation in 1990. By 1997, it had joined the WTO ahead of uh, China, of course. And um, however, uh, uh, the lack of a stable and predictable investment regime is in impeding the development of its very rich natural resource base. I think this has uh, lessons uh, to apply to North Korea that uh, large foreign firms will not go in and invest in North Korea unless there is a stable and predictable um, investment regime so that their long-term investments are, are, uh, 
are protected either by, uh, under a delayed unification system, some legal framework in North Korea, under some modification of that by guarantees from the South Korean government. Um, so uh, the development of a mixed state private uh, capital market takes time. If we look at the examples in uh, China and Vietnam, uh, China opened up in 1978. And uh, 12 years later, uh, the first uh, its stock market, a very, very um, early stage of the stock market was established. And that took 12 years. It was a very small non-state sector at the time. Um, Vietnam, uh, 1986 is when the Doi Moi program started. Its stock exchange, a very fledgling one uh, in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, was opened in uh, the year 2000. So we're talking about 14 years there. Uh, both uh, systems decided to access the international capital markets a little before the opening of the private markets to, to, uh, of, the, of the domestic financial system to equity financing. And um, Moody's, as any rating agency, follows developments in the capital markets. And we had our first uh, rating on China uh, 10 years after the opening, and in Vietnam 11 years after the opening. Uh, it's only in China now that really the, the, the capital markets are, are developing in any uh, healthy, I think, in constructive direction. Uh, Vietnam, it's still, a, it's still a struggle. So, um, but even in China, in the case of the private markets, I mean, it, it's more than 30 years after the reforms were, were announced, and um, China is still struggling with how to incorporate the private sector into the economy. Third plenum of the 18th Party Congress said that the private sector or market forces will be a decisive allocator of resources. Uh, but how do you do this in a system where, the, if not the Communist Party, the state controls so many economic uh, uh, leverages, uh, levers, I mean, and policy tools? Um, and so this is still something that has to be uh, worked out, even, even in, the case of, in the case of China. Um, that being said, I think we're. Um, where one of the, uh, uh, so if a delayed unification process does happen, um, I think um, an easy way to get investment into uh, any economy, um, looking historically, is to have special economic zones. Uh, they were very successful in the case of China. Shenzhen was opened just two years, established just two years after 1978, after that uh, transformative uh, third plenum of the 11th Party Congress. Uh, and, and nowadays, uh, Shenzhen was just a sleepy farming or fishing village back then in 19, 1980. Now it has the highest per capita GDP in all of China. So the developments there have been really uh, transformative. Now, I think none of that would have happened if, if uh, of course, none of that would have happened uh, if there wasn't the internal leadership that would drive this. So that raises the question. I think if you're talking about an opening, and, and perhaps this afternoon or uh, maybe one of the discussants will talk about this, is that where will the leadership come from uh, that, will, that will drive the, uh, the opening of, of North Korea? Um, well, does it exist now, or is it something that will come upon the scene uh, in the future? If we look at China's example, and I think China's a good example, because China transformed itself from a totalitarian Maoist system. Uh, and back in 1978, the leader was Deng Xiaoping, where they decided to take a different path. Instead of perfecting socialism into communism, they decided to become a socialist market economy and, and, and go down the, essentially, the capitalist path. Um, now, Deng Xiaoping was someone who already existed in the system. In fact, he was, during the 1950s, he, had, he himself had a transformation. He was the enforcer for Mao's uh, anti-rightist policies. Uh, during the, uh, uh, the time of the Great Leap Forward and before that, the Socialist High Tide, uh, 100 Flowers campaign and all that. He himself went on to run a transformation, probably the, his experiences in the Cultural Revolution probably had a lot to do with that. Um, so uh, you had this internal leader. So the question is, does North Korea have somebody lurking uh, in, in the system? Um, and then looking at a more recent example, in the case of Myanmar, Myanmar is a socialist uh, economy, um, or was a socialist economy, is undergoing a transformation since uh, 2010. Um, like North Korea, uh, dominated by the military. It's, uh, in Asia, other than North Korea, it's been, I think, the government or system that has been dominated by the military for the longest period of time. The military took over in the early 60s in Myanmar. 
But where did the leadership come in, in Myanmar? Myanmar was something different. You had generals who were chafing under the, the, the authoritarian, totalitarian leadership uh, at the time. And uh, the, the current president, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, Kain Sign. Um, if there are any Myanmar experts, please uh, correct me. Uh, he was something that, he was in the system and given the opportunity, he broke out and took Myanmar along a different path. So my question is, none of this will happen in North Korea, delayed unification. Of course, a collapse could happen, it's in, independent. Uh, unless there's a leadership in North Korea to, to take, uh, to, to open up, and I just don't know uh, where that will come from. Maybe it's a question that's really impossible to answer until we see what, what, what happens. Um, <clears throat> So if North Korea were to, to get back on uh, what North Korea could do to attract foreign direct investment, is that it's to open up the free export zones. Um, and other countries, I talked about Shenzhen, uh, they worked out very well. Um, I've had experience in traveling to a bunch of free export zones throughout, um, throughout Southeast Asia. Uh, Philippines is a good example where they have um, uh, export zones where not just foreign companies, but also um, uh, domestic companies can operate. And of course, the benefit of a free export zone is that it insulates the, the business environment, uh, protects investment from the inefficiencies and lack of governance or weakness of governance in the system as a whole. Um, tax benefits, uh, income tax, corporate tax, VAT, expedited customs procedures, uh, things like that work out really well. Um, Moreover, uh, there are linkages, even though export zones are, are zones or enclaves, there are linkages to the, to the domestic economy in the sense uh, where you see in, in Philippines you have many companies that the middle level management is actually Filipino. Uh, in fact, I visited one company that makes hydraulic pistons for airplanes, uh, the airplanes that we all fly on, and I asked the expatriate manager, how many do you have in this? Uh, uh, in, your fact, in your factory, your plant here in the Philippines, it was in Baguio. And he said, well, I'm the only one, and the head office in the U.S. thinks it's one too many. The, from the engineers to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the managers are all Filipino. Now, the reason I mention that is that uh, I did visit the Kaesung Zone um, uh, some years ago, uh, several years after the opening, and um, I didn't see any of these, these, these attributes. Sure, the, the workers were performing diligently um, and the supervisors were supervising seriously. Uh, but yet it, it seemed to be more, uh, the, the interaction between the North Koreans and the South Koreans was pretty, pretty absent, I think. And so um, Kaesung, I think, is a, a positive seed from the Sunshine Policy, um, but yet it hasn't germinated fully in the way that other special ec uh, economic zones have um, uh, elsewhere in Asia. Um, the, uh, just to summarize on, on the costs and benefits, I'll, I'll close here, is that um, in, in terms of the costs, as I already said, uh, but I'll give a little more detail, I think Korea has the, uh, the fiscal headroom uh, to, to accommodate <coughs> a, a gradual um, unification. There are demands, by the way, in, in the South Korean economy that prevents the South Korean government from running a larger fiscal surplus than it already has. Actually, if you include the, as, as we do in general, IMF standard accounting, if you include the national uh, social security fund surpluses, as we do in the US deficit uh, budget calculations, South Korea is actually running a small surplus. Um, but um, uh, nevertheless, there are, you take, take out those surpluses and then you get a small deficit. You take that and the debt to be refinanced every year is only 2.5% of GDP. And in, uh, in the case of, of uh, China, it's 6.1% of GDP. These are the figures for 2014. And then in the case of Germany, it's 6.8% of GDP. So uh, whether you're an emerging market, rapidly developing emerging market or mature economy that has absorbed a unification, it would appear that South Korea has several percentage points of GDP, at least over the short to medium term, to in which it can can provide um, uh, assistance to, uh, to North Korea, either directly or indirectly through its state-owned uh, uh, companies. Um, uh, second, um, I'm intrigued that um, uh, President Im Young bak in 2007 had a, his uh, Vision 3000 uh, idea of a mini Marshall Plan for, for North Korea. Um, now this wouldn't, I don't know how much this would cost South Korea in boosting 
uh, North Green per capita incomes to $3,000 to whatever they are now, I think really none of us know because there aren't any adequate national accounting uh, done in, in, in North Korea. Um, maybe it's 1,000 per capita, maybe it's 500, who knows. Uh, at any rate, um, the, 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 the cost of the Marshall Plan, I mean the original Marshall Plan, was, was actually fairly modest and it, the financial transfers weren't the, the key transformative agent in the Marshall Plan and for the reconstruction of Europe after World War II, but it was rather the policy prescriptions that came along with it and that the U.S. wanted the Europeans to follow a more capitalist system than a more socialist system in which they were headed. And so uh, it was the, the liberal economic elements of, of the policy uh, poor, uh, prescriptions that really helped um, an efficient use of resources in, in, uh, in Europe in the reconstruction. And I think this would also be the case of, of uh, in, in North Korea, if there could be a Marshall Plan that the local leadership would buy into so that they would, would go along the policy prescriptions of, of a Marshall Plan, a liberal policy prescription of, of uh, a market plan. Um, and then, um, of course, um, all, these, all these costs really, uh, as I said before, uh, depend on um, uh, expedited reform in North Korea, and that's really a function of, of, the, of the leadership um, in North Korea. Um, if I can uh, take the role of a, a comment, the commentator um, in talking about the benefits, I'll say one thing. First of all, I just want to reiterate, I think that the elimination of the existential threat is probably a psychological benefits that we can't, we can't um, uh, we can't put our fingers on right now and quantify. It would be good for uh, uh, South Korea. Um, one benefit that, that won't be realized, Victor brought this up the other, uh, last night in the dinner, is the, there's this notion that South Korean firms, at least those that are listed on the Korea Stock Exchange, suffer from a Korea discount that's, uh, this discount that weighs on them from the uncertainty of, posed by, by North Korea, the security threats posed by North Korea. Uh, my understanding of the Korea discount, it's really internal. It's internal to the corporate governance of the uh, South Korean corporations which have historically, I know it's improved recently, uh, or is on the improving trend, has been weak, uh, particularly in, um, in, in management and cross shareholdings and all that. In general terms, weak corporate governance. In more particular terms, probably the dividend payouts are much lower in the South Korean listed firms and elsewhere, so there is, uh, that has an effect on uh, relatively lower, lower prices in, in Korea. So there'd be no benefit, I think, from the Korean market there. Um, from, from a unification or the elimination of the existential uh, risk from, South, uh, from North Korea. Um, in terms of the expansion of the factor markets and getting more labor into the South Korean economy, uh, President Park has her 474 vision where growth will be 4%, the labor force participation rate will be 70, 70%, and the per capita income will be $40,000. I think by the time she leaves the office. Um, I think the more difficult one out of those numbers is the middle one to achieve the, the 70%. Um, for South Korea to absorb North Korean labor, the, the rigidities in South Korean labor market will have to be uh, greatly reduced. Uh, South Korea's labor force participation rate is actually at a level somewhat similar to the current one in the US, and of course there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, concern about how the labor force participation rate in the U.S. has shrunk since the uh, recession in, in 2009. Uh, so South Korea does have low unemployment relative to the U.S., but yet the labor force participation is, is hindered by internal uh, rigidities that would have to be worked out um, by, um, by the South Korean firms. And then lastly, if there is a delayed unification where other great powers can buy in, even before Samsung and Hyundai move in for their long-term investments under a stable investment regime, you have three large development banks in the region that can participate in infrastructure projects, in uh, resource development, and in addition to Korea Development Bank, as well as Korea Exim Bank, you have the development, uh, China Development Bank, and you have the uh, Japan Development Bank. I think they would all look favorably towards investing in, 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 in uh, in South Korea to relieve the direct burden on the taxpayers of, of, of South Korea, invest in North Korea to relieve the burden, direct burden on the taxpayers of South Korea for a uh, process of economic opening under a delayed unification uh, scenario. Thanks.
Thank you. Uh, speaking next will be Bill Bird. Bill Brown. Sorry. It's really interesting all this talk about unification that's been spawned by President Pock's uh, quote, unification bonanza talks earlier this year. Uh, I, for one, really welcome this, this discussion, this conversation, since for a long time I've thought that we in the West, and certainly those in South Korea, have been paralyzed in our engagement strategies, engagement policies, by fears of Iraq-like disasters should North and South be ever unified. In my view, the two economies are highly complementary, and given the right policies, there would be no shortage of willing investors in the North um, should its economy be reformed and merged with that of the South. Economic growth in the North, as we discussed earlier, uh, would be spectacular. In the South, even the region would benefit greatly. I thus agree completely with President Pock on all those points. The trick, of course, though, is to convince North Koreans that they, uh, not southern or uh, foreign carpetbaggers, will be the primary beneficiaries. Perhaps one way to do this is to cast the unification issue, the unification problem, as a merger of two companies with shareholders, maybe not the managers, of the junior company, uh, that is the North Korean citizens, being the primary beneficiaries. It's a little bit different way to cast this unification issue. Um, I did give a paper a few uh, months ago that, um, on the economics of unification that went through a lot of these issues, which obviously I won't go through again. I have borrowed some of them in the paper that I've uh, contributed for this. If you don't have it, I'm told it'll be in the conference report, or I'd be glad to send it to you. Uh, if there's one word, though, that I'd like you to remember from all of this, it's the word ownership. My thinking is we or someone needs to create an ownership system in North Korea before we can even think about investing there. So barring these preconditions, I'll go through just a couple of them, uh, all bets are off. So the preconditions to me, and I think they kind of work uh, either way in a uh, gradual unification scenario or in a sudden one. The point is with the sudden one, the, the new occupiers of the South Korean government presumably needs to be prepared to do all these things very quickly. But it can be in this, I think, a transition then in North Korea could happen over a couple of years, maybe fenced off a little bit more than we've talked about uh, from the South, even in the, in the abrupt change scenario, which would, and so I'm thinking, you know, limit the two-way population flows, gradually open the DMZ if you can, if you can hold it back, uh, immediately enable market mechanisms in the North, uh, and for that reason, don't give too much aid. I'm, I'm concerned of this Marshall Plan too much aid would flow in there, uh, preventing reform from happening. Uh, essential first step is to require that all workers in North Korea be paid with real money, not the socialist ration system that they have now. Um, investments would be in creating new legal accounting and property registration systems. Uh, legal system is imperative here. Um, create a new money and banking system in North Korea. Uh, maybe something like a currency board if South was in charge. Uh, it's so interesting watching. A lot of this is kind of happening already in North Korea. It's what's fun to watch. The dollarization in the North Korea is, is really quite phenomenal. Um, as in post-World War II East Asia, a critical thing, I think, is to institute massive land reform. That underlies a lot of studies, say, land reform in South Korea, in Japan, and in Taiwan. Uh, I won't go to China that way, because they did it in a much more different, different way. But at least in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, land reform was essential to the development of their capitalist economies. So I would argue uh, privatized land in houses to current residents, like Marcus was suggesting, liquidate collective and state farms, push all those assets from the liquidation to farmers, to an emerging private sector, and to state agencies charged with education, health, and, and pensions. 
um, maybe establish a customs union, you know, a bunch of other things. Um, gradually, though, allow capital and labor to flow across the DMZ. And then finally, as the North stabilizes, create a monetary union, common currency and banking system. Um, so once that's happened, let's talk a little bit about investment opportunities at that point. Um, I can sort of divide investment into four different areas, and I'll speak a little bit about each of them, more on the last one, which is the foreign investment. Um, first one is what I call central government investment in northern Korea. So this is be Seoul's bailiwick. Um, I suggest, I think compared to a lot of people, I suggest a fairly modest amount. Um, in fact, I'm a little concerned that the, the huge numbers rolling around um, push people off. Um, it can't be so large as to endanger the South Korean financial system. Uh, in the North, it should focus on creating institutions needed to build a private ownership system. That is all the legal, accounting, tax, information systems uh, modern capitalist economies require. No doubt there'll have to be some short-term aid. Um, the central government can facilitate North South Korean monopoly enterprises um, such as the railway, telecommunications, and electric power systems to connect with the North. But even there, uh, these should be as self-supporting as, as possible. An example, a commercializing North Korean railroad stations, uh, as has occurred in China, uh, easily can, the profits from those can easily pay for rebuilding the railroads, um, linking China and Russia with South Korea. East Coast port development also should be uh, emphasized. So that's the central government sole kind of role. Local government investment, here I'm talking about North Korean local government investment. It's easy to forget a fundamental aspect of North Korea is that the North Korean government presently owns North Korea. Liquidating much of this property and licensing key industry and trade functions should provide plenty of resources that the provinces and local governments can use to, to um, balance their equally, maybe uh, equally large liabilities, especially in healthcare, social security, education, roads, and that kind of thing. Um, the trick, of course, is how well and how fairly it can liquidate this property. China is a great example in this, and China's having trouble. But the one thing, I've, I've followed Chinese economy for what, 30, almost 40 years, one thing we've kind of missed in following Chinese, we were always thinking something would go wrong. Chinese government has been able to feed itself by selling off, divesting itself of state property for 30 years now. And it still seems, seems to do that fairly well. Uh, so I think the same thing could happen in North Korea. Um, domestic private investment. Ultimately, domestic private investment will take on the bulk of investment opportunities and challenges as in any rapidly developing country. Here, South Korea of the 60s and 70s is a great model, where a newly formed money and banking system created a powerful machine for encouraging private savings and private investments. South Korea went from a negative saving country, probably the worst saver in the world in 1960, to the best saving country in the world in about 1980, all on the strength of market-based reforms. North Korea should be able to do something similar. So this then brings us to outside or foreign investment. Here, I, I, I'm having a difficulty sort of separating what would logically be different between South Korean private investment and any other foreign investment. I put them in the same pot. And in fact, I think the North Koreans or, or the authorities ruling North Korea should treat South Korean companies just like Japanese, Chinese, or American or European companies and should push for the best deals possible for the North Koreans. Um, now, what, would they, what will we, the foreigners, the South Koreans, end up investing in? Um, standard model that we tend to look at, or I tend to look at, is um, Ricardo's comparative advantage theory, or the hechler erlin theories of factor prices. Uh, Marcus is talking some about that. Um, that basically says, uh, it's not quite as simple as most people think, um, that, that you produce 
um, goods and services in sectors that you're relatively better at doing and that you discard industries that you're not relatively better at doing. Uh, it's a nice way of saying in North Korea, a lot of things will no longer be made. Um, I, I harp on that a bit because we, in, back in the 80s, again, on the China example, we did a lot of studies on comparative advantage in the Chinese economy. As it was shifting from a uh, socialist economy to a, essentially a market economy, and the prices of everything changed so radically, everything gets mixed up. Uh, and I think we were pretty good at showing that in 1980, a lot of the things that they were investing in and producing were, were illogical once you had market prices. The example I like to give is a paper I did on energy in demand in China. In 1980, uh, China's energy prices were close to zero. Consumer prices were very high, raw material, industrial prices were close to zero. So you bring in on a market, what do people do? First of all, they export the oil. China, uh, China was the biggest uh, income earner, foreign exchange earner in 1980 was oil exports. So in my little paper that I wrote, I said, this is probably not going to last. One prediction that I made that was right. Uh, by, by 1990, and now China is the world's biggest oil importer. But it's easy to see how you change the price uh, given market incentives, everything changes. So I'm very cautious in looking at North Korean industry now where the prices, it's such a mixed up system right now, the prices, some of it is state set prices, some of it is market prices. If you're not careful, you'll get very misleading ideas of what they're good at and what they're relatively not so good at. Um, even so, I think uh, looking, at, uh, looking at data, uh, looking at what's happening closely, uh, the country is changing uh, really, really in interesting ways. Um, with this mixed price system, I think, gradually starting to dominate the state price system. It's a very good thing. It creates a lot more productivity. Um, so I was looking at the trade data the other day, and um, through most of the data we get, it's their trade with China. China reports most of it pretty well, although we're all worried about it oil data. Um, the um, biggest jump in uh, North Korean exports January through July of this year is textiles, up 46 percent. It's not small. It's like 400, 500 million dollars. It's your second le leading export item. Five, ten years ago, textiles would not have been on the list. Um, other things that you sort of think of for North Korea, uh, in which I do still think it's, we would invest in, are the metals and minerals industries. Um, those are actually down a little bit this year. I'm thinking what's happening in the textiles business, can't prove it, but I think uh, more and more Chinese ma textile company managers are getting into North Korea, paying market wages, hiring North Korean women, and pumping out the textiles. Uh, rapidly increasing the production. The uh, productivity is growing enormously because they're paid a market wage instead of the old set wage, which is essentially nothing. In the set wage system, you're not paid. You're given everything. You're given your ration. You're given your lunch. You're given your house, everything. In the market system, you're paid according to what you make. So in this, in this uh, I think a transformation is beginning to happen, and we're seeing it in textiles, and we're seeing it in textile exports uh, to China. So that's, that's one area I would, I'm for sure, want to invest in, textile footwear industry. Um, now, a couple other examples of things we'd likely to invest in, go back to history before the um, socialist communists took over. Um, in Jap Japanese days, Jap Japan, of course, made large investments in northern Korea, uh, taking advantage of the uh, minerals and metals and the coal uh, resources there. One of the most interesting, one of their most interesting investments was the, uh, what's now called the Kim Chek St Iron and Steel Mill in, up in Chongjin. It's by far North Korea's largest industrial facility, over 100,000 workers. The, the plant is a derelict. It's completely, it's a complete disaster right now. The workers are still all kind of hanging around. Uh, 
The Japanese built that plant because one of the Asia's largest iron ore mines, the uh, Musan mine, is just right up there on the North Korean border, and they developed a slurry system and a rail system to get the iron ore down to Chongqing. That, to me, represents a really interesting case study for a very major uh, foreign investment opportunity. But here again, I would say, well, POSCO probably has its eyes on it. I would say, well, you know, Mitsubishi, the Chinese steel mills, American steel, everybody should have, be looking at that. And there should be a bidding war to who's going to take over that plant. The, 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 uh, it would bring in it's probably several billion dollars. That money could uh, then go to the workers, go to reinvest in Chongjin area. It's a very uh, rust belt kind of part of Korea. North Korea needs a lot of help. But selling, privatizing those kind of resources would do wonders for it. Um, other kind of issues, other products, uh, um, of course, non-ferrous metals, North Korea seems to be still quite rich in uh, lead and zinc, uh, some gold. Interestingly, the first US investment in North Korea back in the 1920, I think, was uh, in a gold mine up in North Korea. And the U.S. also invested heavily in, in the uh, rail system. It wasn't just Japanese who built the rail system. Americans were there, too. Um, so um, non-fair smell metals, certainly. There's some interesting developments in the uh, rare earths. Um, I'm a, a little caution on all these minerals and metals, though. I, I've seen the, I guess it's a key new paper. You, you list all the, what, a trillion dollars worth of metals in North Korea that you think you're going to pull out. That's, that's it's just not the right way to think. Um, mining anything, the cost is getting it out of the ground. Yeah, it might be there. It might be worth a trillion dollars if you can get it out of the ground. But the costs are getting it out of the ground, refining it, and moving it. So it's not really the appropriate way to cost those or price those assets. Um, lastly, um, we tend to make, uh, at least in our office, we make fun about Kim Jong-un's ski resort. Um, I think, though, his idea to promote foreign tourism ultimately probably makes a lot of sense. Uh, tourism can employ a lot of workers, bring in foreign exchange, and take advantage of the unique characteristics of North Korean geography and history. Um, and, of course, North Korea is only a day trip for uh, hundreds of millions of wealthy Chinese, Japanese, and South Koreans, uh, who I think will flood the country given, given a chance. Um, many more opportunities are likely to present themselves. My guess is that in the right circumstances, authorities will be in a position of having to make sure there's not too much foreign investment, displacing the savings and investment that should develop within the domestic economy. The main issue for foreign investments, of course, will be to trust, how can they trust the new legal system and to ensure that property rights both for those selling the property and for those buying the property are protected. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> See Terry. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, First, I'd like to thank Victor, obviously, CSIS and NRCS for inviting me here today to participate and be part of this dream team. Although in my case, Victor truly made a mistake because I'm the only non-economist to comment on a bunch of economist papers. But at least um, I get to comment on Bill's paper and Bill and I go way back for a couple four years back in my former life. When I was in the government, we shared an office together for several years, so I'm used to commenting on each other's papers, although this, we didn't talk about this particular subject, but I feel at home. Um, first, let me just kind of make one general comment that's beyond the specific issue, if I could. Overall, I feel fairly reaffirmed um, as someone who has been pushing this unification thing, uh, unification of the Korean Peninsula as a good thing, uh, a, a net benefit on balance for South Korea, the United States, and, and the region. So to hear uh, these two respected economists and earlier panel sort of all saying that there are real economic benefits uh, in the long term with unification, 
uh, it's good, good, good to hear that. Of course, I was always convinced that unification would be a boon, uh, a, a positive thing in terms of security, in terms of human rights issues, humanitarian concerns, particularly from humanitarian concerns. Um, but really, it's good to hear about economic arguments as well and to hear that there are, there are serious investment opportunities in North Korea post-unification uh, and that it will be a robust opportunity. And I would like to thank Bill for that investment tip. I would like to save up money now to invest in the Pyongyang Railroad Station <laughs> and make some big bucks for change. Um, now, quick comment on the near-term cost of unification since I feel like that has come up already throughout the morning. Um, all Korea watchers I, I, out there, I think, um, we all understand that there are serious costs and challenges to unification in the near term. In fact, for many years now, Korea watchers have focused, I would say, in, in, in our studies of potential high costs and all the things that could go wrong uh, in a North Korean regime collapse or unification scenario. Um, and personally, in the decade plus, that I spent in the government, I have to admit that I spent the majority of my time thinking about all the potential uh, problems that might confront the United States and the region uh, versus, and I spent no time actually thinking about potential opportunities of unification. Um, and you know, all the problems that, in my case, it was more security related problems, right? Like securing nuclear weapons uh, in North Korea and then preventing the kind of chaos that really gripped post uh, Qaddafi Libya and post Saddam Hussein Iraq. Um, although I do think that this kind of constant analogy that I'm hearing about post Saddam Hussein Iraq with Korean case is a misleading analogy in some ways because uh, in Iraq there was no South Iraq to absorb uh, this newly liberated state like in um, that South Korea can absorb the North. Uh, Iraq, obviously, you guys know, is highly also fragmented um, along the sectarian and ethnic lines, and the Korean Peninsula is one of the most homogeneous uh, place on Earth. Um, so the point is, though, I, I don't think there's any serious Korea watcher out there that is underestimating the potential costs and challenges uh, that's involving unification. So I just wanted to state that. Almost everyone, I think, agrees um, that even under the best circumstances, reunification of South and North Korea, um, let's face it, would be very expensive and challenging than unification of East and West Germany because uh, the, the two Koreas are farther apart in terms of economies, in terms of education, in terms of uh, technology, ideology, you name it, they're just farther apart. Um, it's hard to get an exact figure in terms of what it will cost. I think a lot of economists have different uh, Bill, like in terms of TAP for rebuilding North Korea and integrating it into uh, South Korean economy. Marcus uh, talked about $1 trillion. I've seen numbers go higher, up to even $2 trillion. Of course, we, we don't have the exact figure. Um, German unification, I think, cost, what, $1.9 trillion over the course of 20 years. Um, I don't know the cost. All I know is that Nolan is the man, and if you tell me it's $1 trillion, I'll go with that figure. The point is, it's, a, it's going to be expensive. Um, but I do think that it's about time that we have more balanced look at various challenges and opportunities when talking about unification. So I really welcome today's um, sessions and this panel. Now, regarding Bill's paper, um, which I will briefly comment on first because it's fresh on my mind. You just spoke last. Um, it's quite detailed, as you just heard. Um, and he really lays out concrete steps toward uh, economic unification, which to even a non-economist like myself makes sense to me, um, and, uh, like the importance of protecting the South Korean uh, financial system at all costs. Uh, allowing the private capital to flow to the north, and focusing on helping to create institutions um, that are needed to build up, I think you said you emphasize this, private ownership. Um, and I note that I think both Bill and Tom have emphasized in their presentations, one thing that they had in common is that the benefits of unification would be fully realized uh, by a robust role of the private sector. Um, not necessarily by just huge investment by the central government or aid. 
Um, I also think, uh, think that Bill's long list of sort of the foreign investment opportunities are spot on, beginning with uh, uh, mining sector, even though you kind of pointed out the cost of the actual mining, but um, with this plentiful natural resources, North Korea, that we already also talked about in the earlier panel, uh, they are really worth developing for export. Um, I particularly think that synergistic effect of unification would be powerful if it really makes, a, makes it possible, the, sort of the combination of South Korea's technology, which we all know is the most advanced in the world, uh, with North Korea's rich mineral resources. Um, unlike South Korea, which virtually has, I believe, no natural, resor natural resources, and um, import 97% of its energy needs, uh, as I think Dr. Kim also on your panel and Bill discussed, uh, North Korea has these large deposits of coal, uranium, uh, magnesite, rare earth metals, and all that. I, I think I'm reiterating this, reiterating this point because it's important. I think the value of uh, minerals is estimated to, I know you talked about some trillion dollars, I think it's six trillion dollars is the number that people are quoting, which is 140 times the size of North Korea's current GDP. Um, and, but it cannot be tapped today because of the primitive state of North Korea's mining um, industry. So obviously this mother load of wealth can be, um, you know, it's on the, in the ground and it can be beneficial if you could you know, get that and we can accelerate the unified, North, unified Korea's economy um, and, and um, attract foreign investment. Um, similarly, I think also Dr. Kim earlier in the panel and Bill's point uh, about the potential of taking advantage of North Korea's iron ore uh, mine, I think this also makes sense, as well as Bill's points about the textile industry. I haven't thought about that at all, but that makes sense to me. And your last point about the tourism industry, with all the jokes aside about the, the ski, fancy ski resort and all the, the state of art water parks and amusement parks and all that, uh, I think it does, when you think about it, I mean, North Korea does have most scenic areas uh, in the peninsula, and which could attract very, uh, many visitors with a kind of infrastructure that South Korea and foreign companies can provide. So I think that is a, a, a serious uh, industry. Now, Tom mentioned an important point about Seoul having uh, ample amount of fiscal um, headroom in a way to absorb uh, over time the cost of opening um, or unification, at least the initial cost of unification um, from direct fiscal transfers to infrastructure investment. Um, I think that assessment is right. I think South Korea has substantial, well, I don't know, you, I would, you call it substantial, but some monetary reserves. And I think it's, it was some over $300 billion, um, which is not counting um, gold hoardings and so on. Um, and so it, it at least has some current account surplus, and it has savings and resources to respond. I guess that's the point, uh, as Tom said, with some fiscal headroom to absorb initial cost of unification. But over the longer term, I, am, um, I do think that South Korea has to maintain uh, financial stability, uh, as Bill emphasized, and South Korea would need to find solutions to at least some of their deep structural longer term uh, domestic weaknesses, ranging from widening income inequality to high household, high household debt, and perhaps the most serious uh, threat to its uh, future, which is, uh, which we also discussed in the first panel, uh, rapidly aging population. Um, and I think uh, developing this sort of, we talk about this often, relatively younger labor pool in North Korea to address South Korea's um, aging population is sort of an interesting discussion point. Um, I think it was mentioned in the first panel that and it's true, South Korea absolutely faces a serious demographic crunch uh, because life expectancy, which is around 81 years old right now, is increasing, which is a good thing because I want Koreans to live a very long time. Um, but the fertility rate uh, is very low. I think um, it's per woman it's about 1.2 children per woman, which is among the lowest in the world. I don't know why Korean women are not having babies anymore. But um, it, so as a result, the OECD, OECD predicts that South Korea will have the second oldest population oh, by 2050. I think it's by 2050, with seven over 
uh, seven people over age 65 for every 10, eight, 10 working age adults um, being by 2050, over seven out of 10 working age adults uh, would be over 65, right? So by 2050. Um, and the working age population from 15 to 64 will start to decline in 2015, which is next year. Uh, so the population as a whole will be then shrinking in, uh, will begin to shrink in 2030. Um, but apparently North Korea's demographic is different. I mean, you know much better than I do, and you said slightly different, but I, from the research I've done, some 91% of its population is estimated to be under 65, and the fertility rate is higher, it's two uh, children per woman. And right now, so right away, I think North Korea would therefore add, if my calculation is right and my math is not my strong suit, and this came from the CIA fact book, um, is some 17 million potential workers uh, aged between 15 to 64 would uh, be added to the nearly 36 million that's in South Korea. So it's a gain of some 47 percent uh, for a total workforce of close to 53 million. Um, the certification could introduce a new source uh, of what I think is badly needed Korean-speaking labor to unify Korea without having to resort to you know, immigration from Southeast Asia or other low wage areas. Uh, South Korean firms could also move some factories out of China where they have been located to take advantage of relatively cheap labor and relocate them into North Korea where the labor would even be cheaper, at least initially. Um, but I'm wondering if I am actually you know, right on this or what your thoughts are on this because, Bill and Tom particularly, because an argument could also be made that uh, as people, goods, and services suddenly flow, right, uh, freely in a unification scenario, uh, that the, so the north and south wage gap would close, assuming, I, I, presumably, and perhaps labor costs would not fall as low as we might think. Um, Although I think Dr. Kim also made a point in the previous panel that the wage gap between South and North Korea would be still considerable for a period of time. Um, so I guess the question is how appropriate or important would wage control be than you know, unification scenario? Um, also, there are some other questions and considerations uh, that I wanted to throw it out there for discussion. Um, once the North is joined by the South, would it enter OECD uh, and thus sort of then forfeit any foreign aid uh, from its members. Um, as well, I think what, there was a case with East Germany when East Germany joined West Germany. Similarly, would, would North Korea no longer enjoy the benefits of the World Trade Organization system of preferential tariffs uh, for developing countries? Um, there are other concerns as well. What about, you know, then this came up and Bill mentioned it and I think uh, Marcus mentioned it which is this very complex litigation over property rights. I think that's a very important point that came up several times now that are likely to arise. And then what about the Chinese uh, investors? Uh, would they demand that their existing contracts be, you know, with northern firms be uh, recognized, adding to then already very high costs uh, to southern, southern firms or foreign firms uh, that, that they would be facing when trying to enter the northern uh, market. Um, okay, so you don't have to obviously have to answer all these questions. I think there's some of these are some of the questions um, that I sort of concerns and I thought about as I was sort of hearing two really excellent presentations. I think my time is up, so I'll just wrap it up there. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. And then our last discussant is Dr. Park. Uh, first, I thank the organizers for inviting me as a discuss discussant in this session. And I'm also not an economist in the economic session, but uh, one of my main areas of analysis is North Korea's political economy. I suppose my role may be to bring some social political aspects of the North Korean economy for the discussion on economic integration of the two Koreas. Uh, presumption, presumptions on the uh, Korean, North Korean economy at the time point of unification exert influence on thinking about how to manage the economic unification process. 
The thesis for economic unification and investment possibilities by the two presenters can be regarded as basic model for the unification and post-unification economic process. Building upon this basic model, I want to add some new points and some complementary tasks to figure out a more complex and concrete model of economic integration of the unified Korea. I would like to bring six points. The first point is current status of evolution of North Korea's official economic system. Kim Jong-un formalized important inst institutional changes in the economy with the so-called June 28 measures in 2012 and other follow-ups in 2013 and 2014. As a, as a result, the official facade of the current North, North Korean economic system can be compared to those of Chinese between 1984 and 1992 and of Vietnamese between 1986 and 1991. Theoretically, this is a social, socialist economy without plan directives to state firms and collective farms. Or in other words, it is a politically managed market economy composed of commercially operating state firms. The institutional and operating operational facade of North Korean economy would evolve increasingly similar to other stagnant market economies of developing authoritarian countries in the near future. Uh, before not too long, North Korea, North Korea would initiate a package of policies to privatize even state firms as China has in 1992 and Vietnam has in 1991. Whether North Korea's such, such uh, those economic reform measures would kick off meaningful economic growth is another question. My second point is unification as merger between democratic and political capitalism. The Korean unification would not be a merger between market democracy and communist command economy as in the case between East and West Germany, but one between democratic and political capitalism. Here, political capital, capitalism is defined as market economy in which profit opportunities are determined not by economic competition, but by political decision. The, re the redesigning of East German communist command economy into a West German type democratic market economy was relatively simple because after the political collapse of the party state, there were no complex net of strong established interest groups in, this, in the society. The political capitalism, which has been evolving in North Korea, North Korea, would nurture a complex set of established interest structures outside the party state uh, bureaucracy because they are located in the society based on private, private wealth and connections. They would survive even after the political collapse of North Korean party state as in other stagnant reformist, reform resistance political economies of post-communist authoritarianism. My third point is plunder of state property through introduction of market institutions. One of the main drive, drivers of introducing politically controlled market mechanism in North Korea has been the fact that under current conditions, they contribute better than the command economy to private enrichment of the individual communist political elites especially through misuse or theft of state property and shadow pri privatization. The introduction of ap uh, apparent free market institutions and former uh, privatization of state property would be accelerated in the future and especially with the advent of prospect for economic unification of the two Koreas because people too long, uh, before too late the North Korea's corrupt political elites would like to seize the last opportunity for shadow privatization and private enrichment. My fourth point would be how to promote pro, pro, poor growth. North Korea has been transformed from one of the most egalitarian society to one of the most unequal in the past 20 years. And uh, one of the most important challenges is to uh, promote pro poor growth in the uh, unified Korea. My 
Fifth point uh, is how to promote North Korean entrepreneurship. At the time of unification, no matter when it, it would be, we will find a host of businessmen with various sizes of private wealth in Pyongyang and other local cities. The unified Korea should not only attract foreign investment and technology, but also nurture a new type of innovative market entrepreneurship among North Koreans. The economic policy must be taken care of promoting small and medium pr private businesses by North Koreans in North Korea. My last point uh, is geostrategic competitions for economic uh, predominance in the, north, in the north of unified Korea. North Korea is located in the center of Northeast Asia and surround, surrounded by snarling countries. The collapse of autarky and opening of the small and weak North Korea would provide neighboring countries with drastically increased chances for establishing influential positions in North Korea. The process of unification might not guarantee South Korea's dominant economic position in North Korea. China might have already positioned itself as the dominant player in the North Korean economy and might try to take advantage of its strong economic position in North Korea to influence the course of, uh, economic, uh, the course of economic, uh, process, economic unification process and the foreign policy of the unified Korea. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so I think our, um, unfortunately, given the time constraints and uh, the time constraints of our lunch speaker, we really don't have time to go to the floor for questions. But I think our discussants have put forward a number of good questions for our uh, two presenters. So what I would like to do is ask each of you to give us maybe two points uh, based on what you've heard from the discussants and from each other. Um, uh, and maybe, should we, Tommy, should we start with you? Sort of two responses <laughs> to what you heard. Yeah. Well, um, I think my, my first point is that um, uh, when you talk about unification, uh, the only way I could see this is happening in, in any looking at historical examples, how other socialist systems opened up, is through this delayed unification process where there's an internally driven desire to reform in North Korea. Now that element I don't see on the scene yet. Um, but if that were the case, uh, then my, my point is that uh, given, uh, it'd probably be uh, not enormous costs for South Korea. Some of the costs could be shared by others um, if there's shared interest in this. Um, uh, however, there would be costs for South Korea. And um, I don't see a bonanza, at least in the opening years, and by opening years, I would say the bonanza only comes when North Korea fully reforms. The two examples I gave were the, the development of local markets, say equity markets, and that took between 12 and 14 years in the case of Vietnam and China. Uh, and China's made a lot more progress than Vietnam since then. So we're talking about probably a, a decade of transition before, uh, unless uh, things accelerate in ways I can't see right now. Great, thank you, Tom. And Bill. Uh, yes, I would echo what Tom said, uh, except uh, one thing I fall back on is a former boss of mine in the chief economist's office. His favorite quote was always, um, um, it's kind of an economist uh, quote, it's sort of, unsustainable trends are not sustained. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you think about, well, duh. Um, but North Korea, to me, is on an unsustainable track. Uh, no one on Earth, I don't think, and we, we try to forecast all the time, but to our, our danger, uh, can forecast what's going to happen there. Um, it is changing, and it is uh, reflecting those unsustainable things that are happening. So my thinking is that they're not reforming. I don't see reform going on, but I do see the uh, uh, Command economy falling apart, gradually, gradually falling. They can't command the command economy, uh, so you have dollars running around. It's a bizarre situation. Uh, so I, in my mind, it's unsustainable. That means for our side, for the South Korean side, we need to plan for what's going to happen, uh, and we can't. We don't know what's going to happen. 
I think the approach that I've laid out though in my other paper sort of does the right thing in that it tries to give the right incentives to North Korea to push them in the right direction. That's about all we can hope for. And then if it does collapse, be ready to move in and as I say, bring property rights, bring ownership rights to the North Koreans. That's the way to prevent a, a, a war, I think. People will, will fight if you're coming in to take their property. If you're giving them their property, they're not going to fight, they're going to like you. Uh, so I, that's my point on that. On, on, Sue's, on Sue's many comments, one, one I would like to harp on is the uh, wage factor. And it's one that it's hard to, uh, it's hard to understand in North Korea right now because of the medical problems, the, the uh, uh, health problems over what, 10, 15 years now of poor nutrition. It's hard to know how much that has affected the population. But generally speaking, we do look and see a North Korean worker population that's, for its wage level, extremely well educated. These people are mostly literate, for example. A literate population can earn, can learn much faster than an illiterate population. North Koreans are mostly literate. Uh, they, they're inculcated with a strong work ethic. Um, they're organized. They know how to be a place at on time. Um, given their wage level, they should be able to be extremely productive people. So the, the, uh, the, the rule we have to work with is not the wage level. It's the wage level relative to the productivity level. This is what Marcus was talking about with the Germans. They got it out of whack. Uh, as long as that doesn't get out of whack, there should be no employment problems in North Korea. South Korea I'm a little bit more worried about because there's a lot of, South Korea used to have a very flexible wage system, it no longer is so flexible, and that could cause some, some problems in South Korea. But just my last question, my last thought is one that I was not able to uh, um, work out, it's still something I haven't worked out, is agriculture. Um, South Korea of course was, the comparative advantage was hugely in agriculture 50 years ago, the North was in industry. Fifty years later, um, I'm not sure that that hasn't reversed. So that a, a unified Korea, I'm just not sure what's going to happen to North Korean in South Korean agriculture. That's something that all of y'all can think about. Great. I think between the two panels this morning, we really do have a very good roadmap of what are the priorities and what are the preconditions to achieve you know, so-called synergy and the sort of investment in a, in a unified career. So I want to thank, uh, apologize to the floor that we didn't have a chance for questions in this um, particular panel. Uh, I want to thank uh, our participants very much for, uh, for a stimulating panel. Thank you. Now, um, so ladies and gentlemen, it's now time to feed you all. So I think we have set up food out there on the, uh, on the esplanade. Uh, please help yourself and please come right back to your table so that we can uh, uh, enjoy some comments from our lunch speaker.